Thanks, Joe. I will be describing what Joe just stated in Navajo and English. We're going to go over a brief overview of this project. The RMPA, which became publicly available in February of this year, encompasses federal, state, private, and tribal trust lands, as well as individual Indian allotments across 4.2 million acres in northwestern New Mexico. This includes areas surrounding, but not within, the Chaco Culture National Historical Park, and it also encompasses 17 Navajo Nation chapters. As you may be aware, the BLM manages a broad range of resources for the public. Our 2003 Farmington Resource Management Plan is the guiding document that assists us in managing these resources for federal minerals and public surface lands. This amendment will consider updating management prescriptions for a few of the resources that fall under our jurisdic jurisdiction for management. This amendment is considering updated management prescriptions for fluid minerals, rights of ways, which could be a pipeline, access road, power lines, etc., lands with wilderness characteristics, and vegetation. The BIA will be using this document to guide their management of Navajo Tribal Trust and individual Indian Alati oil and gas resources for future oil and gas leasing decisions. The geographic area of the RMPA is based on the Minka Shell and Gallup Formation which are part of the subsurface geologic structure of the San Juan Basin. And it's where most of the oil and gas development has been happening in the recent years. An EIS is a document that analyzes the impacts of a federal action before, before a decision can be made. The BLM and BIA each have five different alternatives within the RMPA that offer a range of possible management approaches. Each agency will choose one of these alternatives in a record of decision. The development of this EIS is guided by the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, or you may have heard of this as NEPA. I would now like to introduce Sarah Scott, the BLM project manager, and Robert Begay, BIA project manager. Sarah and Robert will also be assisting in the moderation for today's session. Good morning, thanks Jill. Um, hi, welcome. I'm Sarah Scott, the project manager at the BLM Farmington Field Office for this project. 
I've worked at the BLM uh, here in Farmington since early 2000, um, and I've had several different roles in the office during that time. Um, that's really led me to have a great appreciation for the for the area and the uh, multiple use mission of the BLM. Um, I'm originally from Missouri, but I've been out west for so long, I feel like it's home now. So that really does drive my desire to um, do my best with that uh, multiple use, use mission for the BLM. I'm really happy to be here today. I, I wish we could do this in person, but um, this is a kind of an exciting new uh, front for us. So thank you for joining us. And um, I'm happy to be moderating uh, with my co-host Jill and uh, co-lead project manager, Robert Begay. So Robert. Robert, we're unable to hear you. We may want to come back to Robert. Should we uh, go on to the next one? Sure, let's go ahead. Um, we'll try to help Robert with his technical difficulties. I'm sure you've all seen as we try to navigate through this new way of communicating through trying to do these virtual meetings, uh, there are always hiccups along the way. Um, and so we're still trying to figure out all the technical aspects of it. It's definitely not been perfected, um, but we did want to continue to move forward and do some additional outreach since we did get this 120 day extension. We wanted to ensure that the public uh, had an opportunity to ask their questions. Um, and we're hoping to get Robert hooked back up so we can hear from him. Um, in the meantime, let's go ahead and move over to Rick. Rick, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Welcome, everybody. My name's Rick Fields, and I am the field manager for the Farmington Bureau of Land Management's Farmington Field Office. I've been the field manager since 2016 and have been with the BLM since 2009. Previously, in Oklahoma, I served first as an archaeologist and then as an assistant field manager. I'm a veteran of the U.S. Army, uh, enrolled citizen of Cherokee Nation, and I live in Farmington. Thanks, Rick. Lester, are you available to introduce yourself? We are having some communication issues. Um, what about Maureen? Maureen, is your microphone working for you? I believe Maureen is in the same location as Robert. Hmm. I just received a text that she needs unmuted. If she's joining via phone audio, she'll need to unmute on the computer as well as on the phone, I believe. We can hear you now, but you have a, a big echo. So go ahead and, and uh, if you have your audio trying to work on your computer, mute your computer if you're going to use the phone to speak. You guys got to end there. We heard you for a second there, Robert. No, yes. can you hear me? Teresa? Jill? We, hear we can you. hear you, Robert. Are you ready to introduce yourself, Robert? Just move on. <laughs> that sounded better, Robert.
thanks again, everyone, for your patience. Um, as we're trying to work out these kinks, of course, everything worked and all of our practice sessions. Uh, we're having a little bit of difficulty today. It may be the room that we have uh, some of our team members set up in. Um, we do, some of our senior people we do have here, we do have Robert Begay, who's the BIA project manager, and he's also the archaeologist for the BIA. We have Lester Sosi, who's the superintendent for the Eastern Navajo Agency, and Maureen Joe, who is the director of the Federal, Mineral, Federal Indian Minerals Office. We also have over 30 subject matter experts on the BIA and BLM ID teams. If our ID team can wave their hands so the audience can see where you are. Um, so our ID team, they'll be introducing themselves as questions go their way. Uh, we wanna be able to start our question and answer session with you all. Um, so we'll go ahead and wait to introduce them until we get an answer for them. We are very excited to hear from you today and respond to your questions. We've been working very hard over the past six years to develop this draft document. We are aware that maybe not all things are clear to you, so we want to ensure that we are able to assist you in understanding what we're doing, our range of alternatives, and the process that we are using to get to a decision. As with the rest of the world, we are definitely having to find new ways to communicate we have seen our schools step up and do virtual learning. We have seen our grocery stores move forward. And the federal government also wants to ensure the public that we are continuing to move forward as well. And we are also adapting to these changes. Please know that we will do our best to respond to all of your questions today. If we are unable to respond to your question directly, or if you are unable to provide us with a question, Please send your questions or call our project managers, Sarah Scott or Robert Begay for further assistance. We do ask that all participants extend the courtesy for other attendees by not using profanity when speaking. As a reminder, we are not accepting formal comments today. Today's session is to focus on clarification of the document. We want to ensure you understand what we are doing here so that you can make your formal comments either through the project's e-planning website by leaving a voicemail comment or by mailing your comments to either the BLM Farmington Field Office or the BIA Navajo Regional Office. We will be providing addresses to all of these locations shortly. We will begin the question and answer session by first seeking any questions that an elected tribal official or representative of an elected official. After this, we will call on attendees that submitted a question during their registration or indicated that they wish to provide a question during this session. Once these are complete, we will move on to the open format and begin to take any additional questions that you may have. I would now like to ask if we have any elected officials or representatives of an elected tribal official that wish to ask a question, to please use the raise hand feature on your Zoom platform at this time. If you're joining us by phone and you are an elected tribal Oops. official or a representative of an elected tribal official and wish to provide a comment or question, please press star nine and that'll let us know that you're interested. I will go ahead and take a look to see if we have anyone that has their hands raised. And I do see Mario Atencio. Mario, I am going to open up your microphone and let's do a quick sound check first to make sure that we can hear you. And then once we have confirmation on that, we will um, we'll go ahead and mute ourselves and allow you to state your question. Can you hear us, Mario? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Okay, thank you for your, for this time. Uh, 
Bishbasa and Daniel so a banash nish auto di a letter. I'm going to read a letter from Daniel so regarding this meeting. He asked me to read this. Um, this letter is uh, addressed to uh, Director Tim Space at New Mexico State Office, United States Bureau of Land Management. Um, this is requesting Bureau of Land Management to suspend the Farmington Minkos Gallup Draft Resource Management Plan Amendment. Um, dear Mr. Spacek, I am writing to request to you, the, the writing requests you to direct the Bureau of Land Management Farmington Field Office to immediately and indefinitely suspend the Minkos Gallup Draft Resource Management Plan Amendment process. Despite the, the 120 day extension of the comment period by Department of Interior Secretary David Bernhardt, the Navajo Nation is still in the midst of an extreme human health emergency caused by the SARS coronavirus 2, COV2 virus. On May 14th, 2020, the Navajo Nation's Nabikiyatki Standing Committee passed the resolution NABIMY-23-20, an action relating to the resource and development and Nabikiyatki committees requesting the Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Indian Affairs to extend the deadlines for Navajo Nation input into the programmatic agreement for, the, for fluid mineral leasing applications for permit to drill and associated rights of way development under the Farmington Mancos Gallup Resource Management Plan Amendment and Associated Environmental Impact Statement. This resolution that was passed requested an extension of the comment period due to a declared public health emergency. Since passing this resolution, the Navajo Nation has experienced infection rates that were for a period of time among the highest in the world per capita. The expectation for the Navajo Nation to engage in quote unquote meaningful consultation regarding the amendment of a resource management plan while the Navajo Nation's focus has been singularly focused on battling the SARS-CoV-2 global pandemic is extremely burdensome to the Navajo Nation. Further, the use of virtual meetings does not constitute meaningful consultation. It would be reasonable to expect that meaningful consultation should require significant time to have to have in-person multimedia supported extended dialogue with with BLM FFO regarding certain sections that involve the Navajo Nation and its local chapters interpretations of but not limited to jurisdiction of the Eastern Navajo Agency the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, Section 106 of the Navajo, of the National Historic Preservation Act, and the Native American Graves Protection Act. The type of meeting I am requesting adheres to the long-standing trust doctrine that the United States has developed in engaging with federally recognized tribes, pueblos, and nations. Regarding the Eastern Navajo Agency, in an April 28, 2020 letter addressed to you, so this is Mr. Tim Spacing, I relayed the bold point that the importance of in-person public meetings for this project is essential, especially given that many of the affected communities in Eastern Navajo do not have reliable internet access and there is a need for interpreters and translation in Navajo and possibly other languages. In the three months since that April letter, the Eastern Navajo have not realized have not realized a transformative tele telecommunication renaissance. Taken into take taken in account the lack of reliable internet access, the Bureau of Land Management should not expect any significant amount of Eastern Navajo public participation, Bureau of Land Management virtual public meetings. To reiterate, I request this amendment process be suspended indefinitely until it would be deemed safe for tribal citizens, tribal leaders, and 
employees attend in-person meetings. Sincerely, Daniel So, Health Education Human Services Committee, 24th Navigation Council. That's one thing. And so I'll, I'll go on and in, in, in the public side, I'll comment as a spokesperson for my mother and father's estate who are individual Indian allotment holders. Thank you, Mario. I'm going to hand this over to BI Navajo Regional Director Bart Stevens and BLM Farmington District Manager Al Elser to respond. Bart? Good morning, Mario Tencio. Um, thank you for reading that letter into the record. Um, understand the comments. Um, understand also that um, the request being made to suspend the activity um, indefinitely was made. Um, the letter is addressed to Tim Spisak with BLM. Um, I know I was copied on that document as well. Um, so in terms of guidance going forward, uh, we've answered this before in the past that the timelines were set by, by central office, by the department. So we're just accommodating those timelines. Um, being um, that we have to do so in this manner, um, not just through the internet, but also through telephones. Um, and I know cell phone services is sketchy as, as I too live out on, on the Navajo reservation. Um, so I understand that, but I'm gonna allow BLM to reply on behalf of Mr. Spisak, um, BLM state director, which is kind of my counterpart at, at the senior executive level uh, from the BLM. Thank you, Director Stevens. This is Al Elser, the district manager for the Farmington District Office. Um, Mr. Spizak is not able to uh, respond at this time. However, I, I would like to, on behalf of the BLM, uh, address your comments and concerns, Mr. Atencio. And um, I, I think we all recall that back in May, we had a number of Zoom meetings that were part of our uh, comments period, taking comments on the uh, on the Zoom platform. And one of the things that we heard a lot of, during, actually two things that we heard a lot during those meetings was um, first that the comment period needed to be extended. And fortunately it has been, has been mentioned, we did get um, by the secretary's order 120 days additional uh, time for this comment period. And so our comment period now ends uh, about a month from now on September 25th. And one of the things that we collectively, the, the two agencies chose to do during this time was also hearing the concerns that were voiced during those Zoom meetings about uh, public outreach. So what we're doing now with these, these meetings to today and for the next three days, so a total of eight meetings, mornings and afternoon, is outreach on this document to try to help the folks that are out there in the tribes and the Pueblos and the public in general understand the document. Um, we really recognize that part of the NEPA process, it's very important to get that buy-in to a document like this where we get the comments from the public. And in order to do that, you know, these documents are, are pretty long, they're uh, pretty technical in nature, and taking this opportunity to reach out and have all of our specialists, we've got a huge number of our ID team on this call right now, um, they're available to answer questions and to help explain that document so that that can help inform folks when they're ready to make those comments um, and get them in in time. So. We, we wanted to get these set up early enough um, in, the, uh, in the comment period or with enough time in the comment period so that folks could get a lot of information out of these meetings and really inform themselves so that they can get us those comments. Um, with respect to putting a pause on the process itself, of course, as I mentioned, we got the 120 day extension and that really is, is probably all we're going to get at this point. I think the entire world is, is figuring out ways to 
move forward during this pandemic, and it's challenging to say the least, um, more challenging for certain communities than others. But you know, we're seeing that the um, farmers are still being able to get their their crops to market. Um, ranchers are still being able to do their work. Grocery stores are remaining open. Um, schools are opening up, and we're all doing it through um, a number of different means, whether it be social distancing, whether it be um, things like this, where we've got a, a, a digital um, outreach. So, you know, we recognize that this is a really challenging time, but we can't just sit on our hands and say, okay, we've got an additional 120 days, let's see what happens. So that's why we're, we're moving forward with these meetings today is to really try to um, take advantage of this 120 days so that the public can be as informed as possible when they make those comments. Um, Jill, I think that's all I have in response to that. I'll go ahead and pass it back to you. And thank you, Mario, I appreciate your comment. Great, thank you. Do we have any additional elected officials or representatives of elected officials uh, that would like to provide a question for today? Hi, Mario. Uh, Mario wants to provide another question. Um, you can begin speaking when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Just wanted a quick response to those two responses. Um, so from the BIA, uh, Mr. Bart Stevens um, just said, uh, he understands just how, uh, how burdensome burdensome it is to try to engage in these process from the Navajo Nation since his wife is ha his wife is Navajo and uh, he lives on Navajo reservation he knows just how big and troublesome this whole process is just want to make that clear that's what we heard what he just said and offered no real explanation and only pass it off to a Farmington field office manager who just told us who just said in commenting not on my words, on Daniel So's words, that uh, we're just gonna go ahead and do this by the way. And we know even though we've seen that it's even troublesome for BLM itself to even hold these Zoom meetings. And uh, yeah, this is part of public outreach, you know, and and uh, uh, we can't do anything else. And so we're just gonna go move forward. That's unacceptable. And doing a quick look in the, in the who's all on the Zoom meeting, it's like 99% BLM people. This is no way in, this is not, none of this is meaningful. And so it's a long way to ask a question. How does the BLM and the BIA, Farmington Indian Minerals Office, everyone, all the feds on here, how do they define meaningful consultation and how is that related to not being environmentally racist? And how does environmental justice play into all of this? That's my question. Thanks, thanks, Mario. I'm gonna send this back to uh, Bart, Al, and also Rick Fields, and they can discuss a little bit more about what we do consider meaningful consultation. Bart? Thank you, and thank you for those comments um, and the question. Um, indeed, I did say that we face challenges. And it's not just unique to the Navajo Nation or to the BIA regional office or to BLM. It's everybody in this in the United States is struggling with the same, same issues. Um, the new normal, as they say, with the way of doing business. If, if, if we took the approach that all work needs to stop, all work, you know, we wouldn't be doing the things that we have to do to, to one, address the COVID issues, and two, keep everything moving forward with all our work that we do with BIA. So there are new ways of getting the work done, and this is one of them. 
Um, we understand, as you stated, you quoted me, you know, I understand connectivity issues. I also know there's workarounds to that. I oftentimes go outside of my house uh, to the highest point on the lot that I live on and I jump on calls. Um, I cannot not participate because I have those challenges. I have to make every effort on my part to keep the work moving forward. So we can't just stop work. And I'm speaking in generalizations. I'm not speaking specifically to this RMPAEIS um, dialogue. I also um, pride myself on understanding what tribal consultation is, is defined by statute. Um, and it's, it is allowing a mechanism for communication to happen with all stakeholders, um, including most importantly, tribal leaders, more of a government to government consultation, and then who their delegated authority goes to beyond them, and then stakeholders in general. And that's defined in, in, in Indian Affairs policy with how tribal consultations are, are dealt with. Um, when I came to this project, those are some of the some of the information that I brought forward to being a part of this group and being with BLM. Um, your other comment regarding the amount of employees that are from BIA and BLM, um, this was a BLM project. BIA joined the project later. Um, my project manager from BIA, Mr. Begay, can speak to those, those timelines and dates when BIA became engaged and became a co-partner in this effort. Um, and, and we can explain that. And, and right now, that is why we have the staff, and I believe uh, well-rounded, very knowledgeable in all aspects of this effort going forward, including the detailed technical and industrial side of things, as well as the cultural um, aspect of, of the information that we're bringing forward. And my team is well-rounded, and I consider them to be subject matter experts. So. I wouldn't necessarily gauge it on quantity, but knowledge and subject matter expertise of the BIA team, of which I am very confident they're able to speak to the, the issues that, that may come up during these calls. Um, again, I just want to end my piece by saying, you know, this is going to be the new normal more than likely. As I said, this is impacting the world and we can't stop work um, because of what we're doing. And, and I'm very proud of the effort that the Navajo Nation has made in reducing their numbers significantly, um, pulling employees back to work. And we're doing the same with BIA. So we're gradually getting to a point where, where everyone will be back in the office eventually. Will we ever get back to face-to-face -face meetings? No one can really answer that question. The Navajo Nation, the BIA, the BLM, anybody in the United States that's struggling with the pandemic, which is mostly everyone, cannot answer that question. So in an effort to keep the work moving, I'll just reiterate what I said. We have to have these different ways of doing things. Yeah, I know that the BIA has, um, has worked closely with the Navajo Nation Land Department, with NECA, with um, NTUA, with many others um, to get what we need to get done. And we've done an exceptional job at, at getting things done that have been, been pending for a very long time to get infrastructure development, which includes broadband. I'm on another team that I'm missing the call to participate here with what other entities with universities and other um, entities within Arizona are doing with a broadband project. So work is underway. Um, is it delayed? Yeah, it probably is. Could it have happened sooner? Absolutely. But we're getting to that. And that's why work continues, I guess, is my bottom line. And, and that's, that's what I have to say about that. So I'll uh, turn it over to BLM for, for their response. But, but again, um, I'm confident in, in the team that I have at the table for BIA. Thank you, Director Stevens. Let me, um, let me turn this over to Rick Fields, our field office manager for uh, the Farmington office. Uh, I know he may have a few things that he wants to address as far as what was brought up and then Rick, you can turn it back to me and I'll kind of close the loop on this one. Okay. Um, it's nice to speak to you, with you again, Mr. Atencio. Um, uh, just a few things to point out. Uh, this project started in 2014. Rick, Rick, this is Teresa. We're having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. 
Can you please uh, open your computer or get closer to your microphone? Thank Is you. Is this better? That's perfect. Okay. Um, this project has been on, ongoing since 2014. When the uh, original um, scoping was done, uh, they held um, a series of meetings. When the BIA came on board in 2016, we held over 20 uh, scoping uh, meetings uh, across Navajo Nation. We have had ongoing uh, Section 106 consultation and government to government consultation going along um, during this time also. We have met with the president of the Navajo Nation numerous times um, going along in consultation efforts and giving updates. This uh, is not consultation what we are doing today. This is informational so members of Navajo Nation and the general public and even elected officials can ask questions about the process and understand uh, the document a little better. Our consultation efforts are ongoing. Uh, we are always available uh, upon um, request to meet with uh, the Navajo Nation, and we would be more than happy to, and we expect we will be more than happy to. As you know, we have also been working um, for at least a couple of years now on a programmatic agreement on how to incorporate Section 106 consultation and, and Section 106 responsibilities uh, with a number of um, different uh, officials from tribes and other interested parties going on. So while it, you may not feel that this is meaningful consultation, what we're doing today, it is not meant to be meaningful consultation. It's an opportunity to be informative, open and transparent. Al? Thank you, Rick. I think that um, explains the process pretty well. And I, I really don't have anything to add um, as far as responding to some of what we heard from Mr. Atencio. So I will, I'll just kind of bring up the, um, the fact that I think we were anticipating this kind of dialogue and I'm glad we were able to um, get to it very early on in today's meeting because I really want to remind everybody that as has been mentioned and as Rick kind of closed out with, these meetings are designed to be informational. Um, we're not we're not here to really defend the process, to talk about um, what is consultation, what is not. Um, our goal with these meetings is to answer your questions, um, technical questions about the draft EIS document that's out there for review and public comment right now. So on that note, I just want to um, just reiterate that we're here for you, we're here to listen, and we've got a, a great staff that's online right now ready to answer those technical questions. So I'll go ahead and toss it back to Jill right now to um, see if we've got any, anybody lined up. Thank you. Thanks, Mario, for that engagement with our team and for our senior officials for responding. We do have some questions that came in when uh, some of our attendees registered. I am waiting for those to populate in here and we will begin going over those. Okay, and our first question is from Mario. And his question is, how has the changes to, I'm not sure how to state that, does zero or 0000 and 000A affected the EIS? How has the methane rule recession affected the EIS? So I am going to toss this to the BLM project manager as well as the BIA project manager and you guys will work with your ID team to develop a response and provide that back to Mr. Atencio. Sarah? With O O O O or the O O O O A. So I'm going to toss it to Sheree uh, Dixon, and uh, hopefully that um, is something that you're familiar with. Hey guys, my name is Sheree Dixon. I'm the BLM Air Resource Specialist and um, some of my um, areas of work includes air quality, climate change, greenhouse gases. So this is up my alley in some ways. Um, I will say that our chapter three section begins on chapter on page 3-9 and the climate change section specifically begins on page 3-17 and it runs through 
3-20. As you know, we've seen changes in the BLM's venting and flaring rule over the years. Um, I will say that we have taken that into consideration. Um, as far as the legal part of it, I don't deal with that, but I can tell you that for our emissions, we, one of the biggest sources of our emissions would be emissions from constructing an oil or gas well, and we do take that into consideration of our um, estimated emissions. And that one is in table three, 310. So there's a table three, eight and three, 10 table three, eight also gives an idea for what the historical oil and gas well completions have been over the years. And we've seen like the de decrease in the Farmington field office as far as well completions. As you can see in 2018, we were down to 33 well completions and that estimates the greenhouse gas emissions, um, particularly from oil well completions that we estimated. Quad O and Quad OA, we did also take that in consideration that there, the federal standards may not um, be as robust as they were, but the good news is that the state has stepped in and there are draft methane regulations that are going through right now, in which we have participated with the state of New Mexico as they develop their rule for um, for methane emissions as well as ozone emissions. As you know, the precursor pollutants to ozone are VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds. Their main components could come from the oil and gas industry as well as methane. So if you control some of the ozone, you'll be successful in controlling some of the methane. Um, I will say that uh, we do, flaring is only for safety. So a lot of the reasons that companies may flare may be because of safety or lack of infrastructure. And I will refer that question to someone else on the BLM team. I'll let someone pass that one along for the flaring, how we do flaring and why we would flare. Thanks, Sheree. Um, to talk about flaring, um, let's have uh, Virgil. Do you have your uh, line open? Yes, I do. I thought this would go to uh, Chris Winman oh, for the flaring. Yes, my apologies. You're right. No worries. Chris. Good morning. Yeah, just making sure you guys can hear me. Sounding good. All right. Um, yeah, my name is Chris Wenman. I'm a geologist at the uh, Farmington Field Office. Um, so yeah, just a quick overview on when flaring happens um, within the San Juan Basin, um, you know, for, for wells that are permitted through our, our office, the uh, majority of flaring that we see happens following the completion or hydraulic fracturing um, portion of well development. Um, the flaring is done oftentimes if the hydraulic fracturing fluid um, uses nitrogen foam as uh, to direct prop it into the well. Then as that well begins production, there is uh, elevated nitrogen levels in the gas stream. So those nitrogen levels um, have to be roughly between, between 10 and 20% Hi, um, in order for the pipelines to uh, accept the gas. So during the initial kind of production of that well, um, the gas stream will be flared and the nitrogen levels are monitored um, as soon as the nitrogen levels are acceptable Do for the pipeline um, or the downstream refinery, yeah, um, then that gas that is that put to the production facilities okay. into a pipeline and um, the well is producing. Um, there may also be flaring associated um, with uh, elevated levels of sand in the initial um, flow back from the fracturing process. Um, if, you know, if there's too much sand, they, that can't go into the production facility. So again, the flaring occurs until those sand levels drop. Girl, um, and those, uh, the, the amount of time that they flare is, is just long enough to get those nitrogen levels down or to get the sand levels down um, so that the wells can be turned to the production facilities. Thanks, Chris. Um, that's a great uh, summary of, of uh, pardon me, flaring. 
We'll go back to you, Jill, for our next question. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have additional an additional question that came in uh, with pre-registration. I do see that we have a few people that have their hands raised. Um, I do see your hands. We're going to go ahead and get through these pre-registration questions first, and then we will begin calling on you. So our next question is from Warren Unsicker, and his question is, will the RMPA be further restricting mineral exploration in the region and or hampering permitting? If so, to what extent and where? So uh, Sarah and Robert, I'm going to hand this one back over to you and have your teams discuss it about what, what if any restrictions we're considering within the draft EIS and to what extent those may be. Thanks, Jill. Um, let's turn this question over to uh, Chris Lindman. Chris, again. Sure. Yeah, and if uh, if Ryan wants wants to help as well, that's fine. Um, and I guess, you know, kind of the, the easy answer is it depends on which, uh, which alternative are selected by the BLM and the BIA. Um, you know, the, the alternatives have various goals. So, you know, alternative D is kind of the least restrictive, um, you know, in A, B, and C, the alternatives have various restrictions um, related to what will be open to leasing, what will be, um, you know, what kind of leasing restrictions may be as far as controlled surface use or um, no surface occupancy type um, stipulations on new leases and also timing limitations that um, may be related to wildlife or, or other types of resources that we manage. Um, so, so it depends on which alternative um, is selected um, that would affect, uh, you know, where mineral exploration or leasing for fluid minerals could occur. Good morning, everybody. And just to, my name is Ryan Joyner. I'm the Planning and Environmental Coordinator. And just to add on to the good words that Chris Winman just shared about fluid mineral leasing um, within the Farmington Field Office, I'd like to point out that the 2003 RMP, our current plan, is what we are going to be augmenting with this RMPA. All of the current leases that are out there are currently leased under our current plan or older documents. So this new RMPA, this, this amendment to our current plan, will only impact the new leases that are uh, nominated and then leased subsequent to the plan itself. Any other COAs or plan conformancy issues on current leases will be taken care of through plan conformancy through, instead of the NSO, CSU, and timing limitations that Chris Wenman spoke about. Um, so it, it will have the majority of its impact will be on new exploration, new uh, what are called expressions of interest, and the way that the BLM leases moving forward. And Robert, would you also like to weigh in on the BIA side of things regarding any restrictions for mineral exploration that the BIA is considering in their draft? Actually, I'm not sure that their audio is up and running yet. Um, I think it is, so Jill. I, I guess um, I would, I'm sorry. Jill, this is, sorry, Jill. This is Teresa. Uh, we need to. You hear me? There we go. We just needed one second. Great. Thanks. Uh, yes, and, and that was a great question. Uh, let me um, go ahead and talk about a little bit about the four alternatives that we do have. And BIA alternative A and BIA alternative B, C and D, one of the things that we, the question of restricting mineral exploration, let me just be upfront on this, is that BIA in its mission is really to, has a trust responsibility to the Navajo Nation and the Navajo people to really, um, basically, um, if the Navajo Nation or the Navajo Nation Alatis want to go ahead and develop their min fluid minerals, then BIA's trust responsibility is to help them out. Now, if you look at the EIS on 3.41, we will you can actually look at it 
uh, on on a detail alternative A through B D. Thank you. Great, thank you. Can we see the next question, please? This question comes from Wendy at City. The question is. Can I submit a question on the virtual meeting day? If not, what email can I send them to? Wendy, you are more than welcome to provide your questions to us today or any of the other upcoming virtual public meetings. If we are not able to respond to your question, if you aren't able um, to get our attention today, or if you have follow-up questions, we do encourage you to reach out to our project managers, Sarah Scott or Robert Begay. Sarah's phone number is five zero five five six four seven six eight nine to contact robert begay call five zero five eight six three eight five one five and wendy this is concluding you are the last question that we received as a pre-registrant so now we're going to open up to anyone that wants to ask a question. So if you're online with us today, you or any of our other participants, we ask that you use the raise hand feature on your Zoom screen. What you'll do is you could click on the participants at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And once you go there, there should be an option on the right hand side over there for you to raise your hand. So I know that we did have someone already having their hand raised. I do not see their hand currently raised. Um, so if anyone like, would like to provide us with a question, we are now taking those. If you are joining by phone and would like to ask a question, how you raise your hand by phone is by pressing star nine. Okay, we have a caller that's calling in from the phone. Caller, I am going to say the last four digits of your phone number. And once I do this, I will unmute your microphone and you will then have an open line to communicate with us. Please let us know your first and last name and then let's do a sound check. Okay, I have opened up your, your line caller with the last four digits of 5865. And if you could unmute on your end. They may have to press star six. So if you are joining by phone and I've opened up your line, last four digits, five, eight, six, five, please press star six to unmute yourself. You're all easy. It looked like it worked. So nope, now they went back on mute. Yeah, it looks like someone keeps messing with the mute and unmute button. So I'm controlling the mute and unmute button on our end so that I know who's opening up the phone line and when a phone line is open. Um, so again, I'm going to open up the microphone for that phone number. That phone number is 5865. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you please let us know your first and last name and then provide us with your question? Thank you. My name is Samuel Sage. I'm from Councilor Chapter House. And the first one, my first uh, question is about your translator that you had last week. Um, I'm not speaking about Mr. Robert B. Gaines, Mr. Holgate, or Maureen Joe, but you had another individual there that was translating. And she was translating a totally different topic than what was being asked. So that was kind of bothered me for a long time. I said, where did they get these people? For a long time, for us speaking 
Navajo, we always want the correct translation. So this morning I'm listening and the translations are good. That'll be my first one. The second one is if this MPA is still a draft, why is there a continuation of permitting to drill, extraction, all of that going on? And also, with all of this work going on, and I know that we have been also in 106 consultation with BIA and BLM, it seems like the, whatever the moderators were, some consultants, at times they really don't have any idea what we're talking about with the people that are living here on the land. So, and also, since the 2003 RMPA was approved back then, and we understood that the Navajo Nation president also signed off on at that time. With the new one, that's going to happen too. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sage, for your question. So one question we're going to send to BLM Planning and Environmental Coordinator Ryan Joyner, and he's going to discuss with us why we're continuing to permit under our 2003 while we have an amendment in process. And then I'll follow up with the BIA project manager regarding if uh, we are going to do a consultation effort with the Navajo Nation prior to signing a record of decision for concurrence. So, Ryan? Good morning, and thank you for the question. So, the BLM will continue to lease and explore as well as produce oil and gas under its current 2003 RMP until we have the finalized document signed. So what that means is all the way through the point of actually signing the document, signing a new record of decision, the BLM is still making decisions pursuant to the 2003 RMP. We do our very best to make sure that all the decisions that we make are in alignment with our current RMPA moving forward. But that being said, any expressions of interest, any APDs, and any leases that are currently out there right now were leased under an older plan and are pursuant to those older plans. So once we actually have the new record of decision signed on our new RMPA, we'll be able to then make the decisions that are going to be subsequent to that RMPA with those new leasing stipulations attached to any new uh, development or expression of interest that is uh, uh, brought to the Farmington Field Office for analysis. But up until that point, we still are required to utilize the current documents that we have pursuant to NEPA, FLIPMA, and the Mineral Lease Act. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Robert, can you discuss a little bit about what BI is going to be doing with the Navajo Nation as we get towards uh, signing our record of decision during the development of our preliminary final EIS? Um, one of the questions is that what is the concerns, um, what is the BLM and BIA going to do if, uh, with the Navajo Nation prior to or before the record decision is signed? From here on out, there is the opportunity at, um, to do government to government meetings with the Navajo Nation in addition to any other like section 106 meetings that is still open up to the record of decision um, signed uh, signature. So again, there's, but um, at the same time, we consistently BLM and BIA consistently um, follows through um, with the request on behalf. If there's a government that asks us to, or tribal government that asks us for a government to government meeting, we will, um, schedule those in and, and meet with the, um, the government that is requesting that in addition to the section 106. I'd also like to have um, Maureen address that issue. Uh, Maureen. Good 
Good morning. Yad Eben, Ekehela, She Yaha, Sanat, Hinshla, Homashan Bachishin, Soy A, Dashichado, Tori, Navy, Dashanada, Ekehela, on a spot there, Daisamos, Daido, Daido, Chidigi, Bain Shehatin, Ado, Daido, Strip, Hale, D, Nasco, Adel Ido, Vikis, Chidigi, Nasco, Be. ベッカンデジャトベユーズデイインドネシアドアメリアコンザブヤホシネイギエイヤハジョハレトナワホネーションナトドゼコミュニティーアリダンコバニーギハレトオブゼネコンティニュートエンゲージエンドウィッチオール
And so um, just wanted to, to, to really respond to the question I asked and also uh, Mr. Bart Stevens and Mr. Alzer's comments. New normal is to force tribes to engage while a global pandemic is happening. It still doesn't uh, fulfill the need the, of the original reason and intent behind extending the comment period. It only got worse. And so that's a new normal, I guess, as, as, as we're hearing. So I'm gonna talk about, uh, as a representative of my mother and father's estate, Indian, uh, in, in, in individual Indian allotment holders. And so there's a lot of assumptions in this plan that I really, we really need clarity. And it's best if it's done in person, supported by multimedia um, uh, apparatuses and stuff to do to show us exactly what you're meaning. I found the question uh, not uh, not sufficient regarding the changes to the new source performance standards, changes to quad O and quad A dealing with um, uh, transmission and storage and then the, the VOCs and the methane coming under with regards to air quality and subsequently the Clean Air Act, uh, especially when we start, start talking about public health impacts um, because the assumption there written with your modeling should be should be very significant that you have in there. I think you use the Colorado modern uh, mo modeling um, algorithms. How, my question was, how does that affect that? Secondly, changes, you know, proposed changes through NEPA. We need EPA to talk about that, especially when it comes to cumulative impacts of greenhouse gases and water. Saying this because as individual allotment stakeholder, which I am, there's a water source, water source well across the street from my grandma's house in the Escovada unit and counselors. How, and we've seen modeling from some other researchers which says every time a water supply well goes in for fracking, the water table drops a thousand feet. Those are reserved water rights under the San Juan River water right settlement. How does these systems affect the water rights and the and all the all resources held in trust by the federal government to individual limit individual indian allotment holders further found, i find it very inefficient that mr colgate has not or anybody has really explained not the neck extra go i guess of what we're talking about here there's a lot of assumptions the last assumption that I have questions on is the reasonable foreseeable development with the shut-ins and the closure of Marathon Petroleum's refinery. This idea of Four Corners Sweet Crude, where is the market and how does this affect the RFD or uh, future APDs? And how does that affect, and all these tied together, how they affect each of the plans A, B, C, and D especially when it comes to visual resources protection and conservation, that's just one. So in total, all of these things need to be rewritten into the RMPA and expressly communicated to the individual allotment holders, such as my mother and father. That's a lot. I know it's a long winded question. This is why we need to have in-person face to face meetings where people can actually talk quick and get to the point. That's my questions. I hope someone can answer some of those. Oh, can you hear me, Mario? You can give me a thumbs up. I know you're driving. Um, so you gave us a lot of information and we want to be able to respond to the questions you provided us today. And so we want to break those down into specific parts. Um, but we did want to clarify on the air question that you were beginning, that you were beginning to state um, where you were discussing the Colorado um, studies that we referenced. And I, I'm wondering if you could just succinctly ask that question so we can ensure that we're responding appropriately to you. Yes, the underlying assumption and that's is it chimps, chimps modeling regarding with the cumulative impacts of greenhouse gases. How does 
the changes, the current changes, the quadro and quadro A under 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 the latest rules, how does it affect those? Not only that, that's the question. And does the changes to quadro and quadro A affect the variables therein? And if so, we need to have updated studies and impacts of everything. Not only, that's just one. Great, thanks Mario. So I'm gonna send this over to Sheree Dixon. She's from the BLM New Mexico State Office. Sheree, can you respond to Mario's question? Yes, hi Mario, this is Sheree. Thank you for your question. And um, like you, you know, I'm an air resource specialist, so I'm definitely concerned um, when there are changes to our air quality regulations. And one of the things that the CARMS model does is they have a low scenario, which gives an option for, you know, a, a low amount of wells with no control measures. There's a medium scenario that actually applies control measures. And when I say control measures, there's different things at the well site that we can um, perhaps, you know, put conditions of approval, um, we can put more strict regulations as far as engine levels, as far as how much emissions they're emitting. And we can also, there, there may also be options at the APD level um, to work with the proponent so that they can, you know, make emissions less, um, how can I say this? They can emit less emissions basically is the best way to kind of plainly say it. Um, we do understand the changes that happen with the EPA. Um, specifically, they did affect the methane emissions and methane as a pollutant as well as VOCs, but the CARMS model, it also takes into account that. So the way that the CARMS models work, the CARMS model works is that um, we give a estimated emissions, you know, for what each well could emit as far as greenhouse gases. And then we have the options down at the at, at the APD level to try to mitigate those emissions if there is found to be concerns with pollutants. So we we do it's a it's an iterative process and we go through the process at the RMP level. It's very broad, and I encourage you to stay involved through the leasing cell um, process and down to the APD level. We would be glad to work with you if you have specific concerns as it relates to, you know, maybe um, you may feel like the completion stage is too long and maybe we can work with the proponent to reduce those emissions. There are no guarantees, but we would we would definitely sit down and talk with everyone and de determine, you know, what are the emissions in these areas. Sometimes there's also cleaner emissions going on. Sometimes the proponent options, there's um, proponent measures i can't remember what they're called there the proponent may actually propose measures that are cleaner or more strict than what the federal or the state standard um, is and we have seen that happen down in the carlsbad area with the chevron hayhurst project in 2016 the, there were proponent committed measures in which they agreed firsthand to reduce those emissions and we can do the same thing here. If you're interested, definitely stay in the process and we will be happy to work through that with you. But just do know that the CARMS model is not a static model. That CARMS model was designed to show emissions on different scales. It shows like emissions on a low, a medium and the high. And the medium scenario is where controls are applied and those controls are on the books. But like I said, down at the APD level, when we're getting ready to issue permits for drilling, um, we definitely take a look at what the current emissions are in the area. And, you know, we can perhaps make adjustments if the emissions are trending towards higher levels or there has been historical trends towards problems with emissions. So I am with you. Let us, you know, know how we can help you further. And I would encourage you if you have a specific question um, related to maybe different controls or emissions, you can, you know, write it or get in touch with us. Thank you, Sheree. Uh, 
Mario, next we wanted to clarify uh, your question regarding water. If you're still with us, um, you can unmute uh, your line and begin uh, clarifying that water question for us, yeah. please. Yes, I recently attended the New Mexico Tribal Water Forum and one of the presenters, I can't remember the researcher's name, an elderly uh, uh, Bill Agonder fellow, said that um, when water supply wells are, are used to frack, it causes a thousand foot drawdown of the aquifer. Um, very important because under the San Juan River water rights settlement, individual Indians have 25 acre feet of water under the, I don't know what, 160 acre sections. That needs to be modeled in there and the effects need to be communicated because across from where I'm a stakeholder, there's a water supply well owned by Enduring Resources who said to us, we don't have a water supply well. We use 100% recycled water, but we can actually go over there and look at it and say, you're using this water to frack right here. BIA in their, in, in, as a fiduciary, as a fiduciary for individual Indian allottees and allotment holders need to realize that their rights are being injured, their water rights. That's one thing. Where and how is that even modeled and all that stuff being talked about? And just a comment on, on Ms. Dixon, Mrs. Dixon's comments, it's all speculation. We need to have this stuff communicated with EPA experts saying these are gonna be the high rates, not just of methane, but the, the associated volatile organic compounds. I think six of which we found in a community being high, um, being hazardous air pollutants. And so it's easy just to whitewash all of this when we really need to start talking about the hazardous air pollutants defined by EPA as possibly causing cancer what are those releases going to be in community and what are you specifically asking local leaders to sign on to? This is the level of, of resolution, the finest resolution that needs to be talked about. And this, while I'm driving around having to help the Castle Mario Lake chapter community get hay for their people, this does not, this does not in any way is any of this meaningful. As, as to always go back to the very first point that Mr. Our Council Delegate Daniel So has communicated to all of you. This is where we need to have multimedia stuff and to be able to sit down and extend in conversations. And again, we're, it's possibly being forced. This is just like having a gun to our head telling us to say, all right, Indians, we told you all this big words. And again, Hodge and Mr. Holgate, where's all these people to discuss all of this? This stuff is going way too fast. And the new, guess this is the new normal. Shaft the Indians virtually rather than in their face. All right, I'm going to send this over to the BLM project manager, Sarah. Sarah, can you engage your team on uh, Mario's questions regarding water? Yes, thanks, Jill. Um, I'm going to toss that question over to our physical scientist, Whitney Thomas. Whitney, you want to talk about the water component? Um, it might be helpful to talk about the water study and have a Virgil tag in at the end uh, about inspections. Yeah. Hi, Maya. My name is Whitney Thomas. I'm a physical scientist at the Farmington Field Office. Um, I deal mostly with water and air quality um, in Farmington. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just uh, mention that the Farmington Field Office currently has a um, water study that we are conducting um, with San Diego Laboratories out of um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and we have identified um, the wells that we are currently, the domestic water wells that we're currently going to be using to both analyze um, uh, the water quality in the wells, as well as um, identify any drawdown in those wells. Okay. So the, the wells that are, there's a whole slew of wells that have been identified to, um, to study for the initial baseline. 
Um, out of those wells, we will select a subsample of them to um, place long-term monitoring equipment into the wells to monitor um, uh, the, the drawdown and any changes in water quality. Um, I would also like to address some of the concerns for the water source wells that Enduring has currently drilled. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna um, uh, address part of it and then uh, have our, ge our geologist, Chris Wenman, um, jump in as well. Um, so first of all, with um, the, the permitting of water source wells, that, that happens out of the New Mexico Office of State Engineers. And they have a process that they have to go through to permit those wells and, and address the, the water rights and water shares and whatnot. Um, the BLM's um, uh, 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 job in, in ensuring that um, the water used for fracturing a well comes from a permitted source under the New Mexico Office of State Engineers. Um, and those water source wells that have been put in by Enduring are, are quite deep. Um, they're between um, 5,000 and 6,000 um, well, ground surface, I believe. Um, and the, the um, total dissolved solids in those um, wells are at 10,000 TDS or greater. Um, and so that's why they have drilled into those deep wells to use for fracturing because they have um, identified ways that they can use those high salinity wells. Um, Chris, would you like to talk more um, regarding those water source wells? Um, sure, yeah, I think, Whitney, I think you hit on um, most of the main points, um, you know, as, as far as, you know, injuring offset water rights, maybe I think the depth of the water source wells is the biggest, um, you know, the biggest point that I would make is that, you know, the most of them are, are permitted through um, into the Entrada formation, which is below uh, the Mancus Gallup. Um, so that it is very deep, as you said, five to 6,000 is probably a good average. Um, and yeah, there's the water contained in the Entrada is generally not thought of as fresh water with the high TDS levels, um, you know, so the depth really prevents use um, outside of, you know, industry scale drilling. Um, and then, yeah, the water quality um, is, is not fresh water that, you know, that we would expect to use for, a, you know, a drinking water source um, or something to that effect or, or, you know, a livestock well even or anything like that. Uh, and then I'd also like to mention if, the, if there are specific wells that you have concern with, um, please contact us at the Farmington Field Office and um, we, we would like to know of those wells and so that we can um, sample them within our, um, our study that we have with Sandia Labs. So we would need to know the location and a contact number for who is the owner of the domestic water well um, to coordinate the, the sampling of the, of the well. And um, uh, the number that you can contact us at is again, 505-564-7600. Um, we'd also like to talk a little bit more about your concerns regarding um, health and safety for air quality. And I'm gonna turn that over to Virgil Lucero and he'll talk about um, the inspection program that he has for the in the in um, inspection and enforcement with the Eldar program and the FLIR camera. Thank you, Whitney. Hello, Mario. My name is Virgil Lucero. I'm the supervisor in the inspection enforcement department for oil and gas at the Farmington BLM. Uh, just to start with, I would like to mention the protection of the water that you're talking about. Our first line of defense in this is zonal isolation. What zonal isolation is, is during the drilling phase, we must ensure that formations in the well bore are protected from other zones with an adequate cement job. If it wasn't an adequate cement job, it could possibly migrate up or down between the casing and the drilled hole and possibly contaminate not only our production zones, but first and foremost, our fresh water zones and that is what zonal isolation is. 
And the same applies when it comes to plug and abandon the well. This is our last line of defense. So if the drilling is our first, the plugging is our last line of defense. And zonal isolation is definitely critical. Uh, we have to prevent, prevent contamination and we cannot live with, without fresh water. So not only do we, the BLM and everyone else, our passion, not only do we want our kids to have it, but also all of our future generations. Um, another tool we have is what Whitney talked about, which is uh, the Eldar camera, which Eldar means leak detection and repair. Uh, they are thermal imaging cameras and they're widely used throughout the oil and gas industry as a preventive maintenance tool to help spot leaks in tanks, pipelines, facilities, and improving safety. Minim and also minimizing emissions with less risk of interruption in the, in the well life. And so our goal is of course, to ensure protection of surface and the subsurface environments. So although, like I mentioned before, all those zones above the fat fracking day F might be impermeable shell formation it is still imperative to ensure an adequate cement job has been performed and the total from the total depth all the way to surface between the casing and the formation. Um, any other questions or if anybody needs to contact, please call the BLM. Whitney gave the number. It's 505-564-7600. Uh, and you could actually ask for uh, me and they'll, they'll contact me and I'll get back with you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Whitney, Chris, Virgil, Sheree. I uh, appreciate all of the, the great conversation. Um, I wanted to offer over to Robert with BIA if you have uh, anything you wanted to add to, to the questions. Thank you. <laughs> Girl. Again, Artencio, thank you for those questions. Robert, you may have to mute uh, your computer. Make sure all the computers in the room are muted if they're connected or anything. Is that better? No. All right, we're addressing that. All right, um, what about them? Yeah, that's a little better. Okay, great. So Artinsia, you had asked the question about two things that we have to address. And really two, um, I think your first question about why are we moving forward with the RMPA EIS open house. Um, again, I think the regional director, um, Mr. Stevens had addressed that issue. Um, just to reiterate that, um, that BIA does have a trust responsibility despite the pandemic. We have to continue our mission and, 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 and our purpose as BIA uh, <clears throat> to follow through our trust responsibilities. In addition to your third question concerning the NEPA changes, we know that the NEPA regulations are changing. Uh, we have been in contact with uh, CEQ on this issue and how long it will take. Um, there are some guidance we have been sitting down with CEQ in addition with um, the department and when and how to implement those new changes into the department manual. Um, specifically, we have one year to implement those changes from that are, that are done in NEPA. Uh, the rules and regulations that have changed. Um, we're supposed to implement them, uh, the first part of the fiscal year. However, we have one year to uh, make those changes and implement and make those changes in, in, and make those changes and incorporate it into the department manual. In addition to that, um, there are some outstanding questions that we have posed to the solicitor. They're supposed to give us some more guidance. Do you understand this is the first time since the NEPA law has been enacted, there are changes to it. So there are new questions that need to be answered before we make those. In addition, <clears throat> so those are, we're, we're constantly uh, in contact with the CEQ on that. 
The other the issue on the water issue, I will pass that on to Maureen. She can address those issues. Maureen. Thank you, Robert. So Mario, thank you for the question. And it really is a great question. If uh, I would recommend that because it's a great question and that's something that we really would like to look into with some either through a leasing stipulation or a site specific condition of approval to address the issues that you have presented um, in regards to water rights for Indian allotted um, individuals who live on those lands. If you would kindly submit an official comment to the information that was provided, that would be really great for us so that we can do an additional review and look at that very closely. And maybe we can come up with some leasing situation that will protect those rights. If not at the leasing level, we can do something at the site specific level, or we can do it at both levels. Thank you. Thanks, Robert and Maureen. Um, I think we um, wrap that one up. So I'll talk back to you, Jill. Yeah, that was a lot of information that Mario provided to us that we were able to respond to. We do have some questions that have come in through our chat box. Um, however, before we get to those, we do want to remind everyone that if you would prefer to provide your questions in Navajo, we do have Navajo translators available with us to be able to continue that dialogue. And I'm also going to turn this over to Joe Holgate, and he can do a little bit more of an in-depth explanation regarding the interpretation and how uh, we are incorporating it into today's message. Joe? Joe, I'm not sure if you are on mute. Hey, good morning. You hear me now? We can hear you now, Joe. Thank you. Hello. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, been listening in and what have you. Uh, getting back to a little bit on Mario's concern on um, why uh, all this is not explained or translated to the um, people with no command of English. Uh, perhaps it needs to be understood as an interpreter. I only interpret certain parts that's given to me by my, my uh, employer, such as newsletters and the scope of where this is going. Now to know the RMPA is going to be in-depth learning and studying before somebody can really translate effectively to the Navajo people. Eshi <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Back to uh, Sarah or Jill. So we will be going um, into our chat box. We have a few questions that we've received. Um, we'll go ahead and present those to the audience now.
Okay. Um, this question comes from Rebecca Sobel. It doesn't seem like the chat is made publicly available, as in it doesn't seem like any messages can be sent outside of direct messages to hosts. Thanks for your question, Rebecca. That is correct. We wanted to make sure that uh, we weren't getting a flood of chat messages for people going back and forth to each other. Um, we wanted to be able to really be able to keep a handle on what questions were coming in and be able to respond to those out loud. Uh, we, we had concerns that if, you know, say Mr. Holgate was an attendee today and he provided a question um, and then one of our specialists saw that question and they went ahead and they responded it to you and then that message gets lost in the chat stream. We weren't able to share that question with the audience or provide that answer. So that is why they are going um, only to the host right now. Um, if there are um, other communication issues that you're having, please let us know. Um, if you'd like to ask a question verbally, you are welcome to raise your hand and we can open up your microphone as well. If you are calling by phone, please press star nine to let us know that you'd like to provide a question. Okay, can we see the next question, please? Okay, this question is coming from Teresa Seamster. Teresa states, I entered a correction in the comment section on the RMPA page 3-45 regarding Counselor Health Committee HIA, which should be corrected to HIR, and which will be submitted to the BLM and BI in September. Also, my question was, please explain where environmental justice specifically is mentioned in the RMPA. Environmental justice is now a rapidly developing academic research field with many precisely defined areas of injustice. I would like to share this question with the BLM and BIA project managers for you each to discuss environmental justice and how it's incorporated in the draft EIS. And if we could get some language or some correspondence from your team, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah to pass that question to Mike Johnson. Mike? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, environmental justice is addressed specifically uh, within the RMPA in a couple of different places. Um, first of all, in section 3.73 of volume one, uh, I don't know the exact page number, but that once again, that section C 3.73 of volume one, there is an extensive discussion of the findings of the environmental justice analysis. And in section AE.5.3 in the affected environment supplemental report, once again, that section AE.5.3, there is a detailed discussion of the environment, <clears throat> excuse me, the environmental justice uh, terminology, methodology, and results that uh, were included as part of the analysis for this um, EIS. Thanks, Mike. Back to you, Jill. Robert, did you also want to discuss with your BIA ID team um, how you incorporated environmental justice and the considerations uh, that the BIA went through when developing this draft? Yes, good morning. That was a great question. Um, one of the things is that um, we did look at that. In addition to that, again, we are co-leads on the CIS. And we um, basically really relied on the BLM, Michael Johnson's um, analysis, and it's in the same section. There's no need for me to repeat the section. So again, look at that in the EIS uh, to address your concerns and to clarify your question. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, can we get the next question, please? 
This question comes from Kendra Chamberlain. Kendra asks, will a recording of this meeting be available afterwards to watch? Kendra, while this meeting is being recorded, we are not going to be posting these, uh, these virtual open houses online. I believe we have six hours each day dedicated to these meetings. Um, and so that's a lot of recorded material to be putting on, on our uh, website. What will happen with these recordings is they will be made part of our administrative record and they will uh, continue to assist us as we move forward with developing our final EIS and also they will also help assist us as we're developing the record of decision. Thank you. And Karen, I apologize if I don't say your last name correctly, I believe it's Bichu Bichulano. And Karen's question is, do you anticipate any changes to the proposed action as a result of public comment? And Karen, that's, that's a lot of question right there. Um, and that's the exact reason we have this public comment is we wanna see what kind of information the public has that we haven't previously considered. You may have access to reports and studies uh, that we have not seen and that could greatly affect um, our analysis and that could also change what we consider our preferred alternative. Um, so if you have additional information that we should consider that we haven't previously considered, we do ask you to submit that information as a formal comment. I will ask our EMPS side team to put um, the information on how to provide a comment up on the screen right now. Uh, there's a variety of ways you can provide that formal comment. You can first go to the BLM e-planning page. There under the Farmington Mancus Gallup Resource Management Plan Amendment and EIS. Um, once you go to the documents, there's an area there that you can uh, leave us a formal comment. You can also mail a comment to the BIA project manager, Robert Begay at 301 West Hill in Gallup, New Mexico, 87301, or you can submit them to Sarah Scott at 6251 College Boulevard. That's in Farmington, New Mexico, 874. Thank you, Jill. Um, yes, and that was the whole That was the whole purpose under the public comment, under, according to NEPA rules. The reasons why we have public comment is to really look at the alternatives. If there needs to be some modifications to it, um, to address some of those concerns that we might not have addressed in the EIS analysis. Again, thank you. And yes, that's the purpose of the public comments. Great, thank you, Robert. Um, so I do not have any additional questions in our chat feature. We are still taking your questions for the next 43 minutes, and then we will also be continuing this this afternoon from one to 4 p.m. So if we don't get to your question today, or if you wanna think on some of the information that you received this morning and have some follow-up questions, we'd be happy to respond to those this afternoon. Um, if you would like to provide a question, again, please raise your hand if you're on Zoom. If you're calling us by telephone, press star nine, or you could also provide your question in the chat box. On the screen right now, if you are on Zoom, uh, is showing the ways on how you can submit your formal comments for the RMPA. Um, I went over the BIA and the BLM mailing addresses as well as how to visit online, which is the website for the RMPA EIS is www.blm.gov forward slash nm forward slash Farmington. If you'd prefer not to send a letter and not go through e-planning, you can also leave us a voicemail comment 
And the voicemail box for this is 720 213-5786. Okay, and I don't see anyone that has their hands raised right now. And as I stated, we have a little more than 40 minutes uh, before this morning's session ends. And since we don't have anyone with a hand raised, uh, we'd like to maybe go over some of the questions or comments that we've heard over the past six years as we've uh, developed the draft RMPA to get to this point. Um, Sarah, are you ready? Robert, are you ready to work with our RD teams to respond to some of these questions? Definitely. Um, let's, uh, let's have a... Uh... BLM, uh, let's talk about um, induced seismicity. I know that's a concern that comes up. Um, Chris, can you talk a little bit about uh, about that? Um, and is it a concern in the San Juan Basin? Uh, sure, yeah, happy to talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so in, induced seismicity, probably, um, you know, the, the most famous example that people have heard about is over by Norman, Oklahoma. Um, so for the San Juan Basin, um, you know, part of what's different here compared to Oklahoma is the overall geologic setting. Um, you know, the San Juan Basin and the portion of the basin that's covered by the RMPA planning area uh, is part of the Colorado Plateau. Um, and that is a geologically stable, you know, pretty thick block of the Earth's crust, basically. Um, it has very little crustal scale uh, deformation, which, you know, deformation could be faulting or folding. Um, the basin is also under uh, an extensional deformation uh, stress setting, which causes a slower buildup um, of stress within the Earth's crust. The areas um, that are very famous for earthquakes, um, you know, Alaska, anywhere really around the Pacific Ocean, California, um, those areas are under uh, compressional deformation or a kind of squeezing pressure. Um, and that's where you get really big faults, um, you know, that would be, uh, you know, you would expect to cause large earthquakes. So the San Juan Basin is a geologically stable area where we don't have faults generally on those scales. Um, secondly, um, and I guess some information on that stability, you know, the USGS, United States Geological Survey, um, is kind of the authority on uh, seismicity, earthquakes, um, you know, in the United States. Um, they have a 2018 map um, that shows this area, the Colorado Plateau area, is having a minimal risk um, for seismic hazards overall, so earthquakes. And uh, I'm sorry, that was from 2014. Their 2018 map from USGS um, is a short-term induced seismicity risk map. And that map also shows very minimal risk from induced seismicity across the Colorado Plateau area. Um, you know, we do have a lot of uh, injection wells in the San Juan Basin, which are used to uh, take water that's produced alongside oil and natural gas um, that's naturally occurring in the formations targeted from oil and natural gas. Um, you know, something has to be done with that water. Um, so oftentimes it's injected back into the earth. Um, the depths of the injection wells are variable. Some of them, um, I said earlier, the water supply well um, that Mr. Atencio was asking about um, was in the Entrada. We have some injection wells in the Entrada. Um, and there's, you know, there's a few different formations um, that, uh, that injection wells are permitted in, and most that's mostly handled um, by the state. Um, you know, we do have uh, some uh, involvement if it's on BLM land, but the actual injection well um, is permitted through the state. Uh, and a little bit more, pull my notes back up here. Um, you know, in, in Oklahoma, um, they're injecting into what's called the Arbuckle Formation, and that's directly over top. Um, crystalline basement rock, which is where you would expect larger faults to, to occur. And injecting the produced water in, in the wells, what it's doing is, um, if you imagine rocks as having a bunch of small, you know, 
pieces of rock kind of sitting together. Um, if you pump water into those formations, it's increasing the pressure between those grains and it's pushing them out a little bit. And so it's increasing the pore pressure, which is uh, allows faults uh, or encourages existing faults um, to slip possibly. And so here our injection wells are not directly over top of crystalline basement rock. Um, there's almost 14,000 feet of sediment in places of the San Juan Basin. And our injection wells, I would say are on average, uh, or you know, they're not BLM's injection wells, but the injection wells on average are probably at 6,000 feet depth below ground surface. So um, we're not directly over top of uh, formations that we would expect to have pre-existing faults. Um, the injection wells themselves don't create faults. Um, so they're just changing a little bit of that, you know, how the stress in the rock is acting at depth. Um, but overall, um, this portion of New Mexico, the Colorado Plateau, the San Juan Basin, um, very geologically stable. You know, if you look back at, uh, you know, an earthquake history of New Mexico, it's, it's fairly minimal compared to, you know, places like California, the San Andreas Fault. Um, you know, and, and we haven't seen, you know, we have a lot of injection wells already. We have not seen an increase in seismicity as a result um, of injection, you know, whereas in Oklahoma, they found that, you know, they turn a couple of those injection wells off and the very small, um, you know, all the, those kind of smaller earthquakes um, sort of tail off a few days later. Um, you know, we don't have any evidence of that kind of induced seismicity here in the basin. Um, so I hope that helps. Hope it wasn't too long. Um, yeah, and if, if there's additional concerns, just, just ask a question on here. I'd be happy to uh, talk about it a little bit more. Thanks, Chris. That was that was excellent. I it, I'm in awe of, of this ID team's knowledge. So back to you, Jill. Great. Thanks, and I agree, Chris. Excellent job explaining that. Um, so we did have some folks that identified when they were registering that they would like to provide us questions. I believe we have seen um, questions from all of these folks, but I'd like to offer them the opportunity if we have not responded to a question that you had. Uh, that opportunity to talk to us now. And first is Mr. Mario Atencio. Did you have any additional questions you would like to ask of our team? If you do, please use the raise hand function or star nine. I think you were driving. So if you need to press star nine, that'll let me know you're available and I can open up your microphone. And I'll give you a few seconds. Like Mario's left thinking. Yeah, it looks like he is not online. Mario, if you are online and you can hear us, but we can't see your name or see your hand raised, uh, we can come back to you either before this morning session ends at noon or sometime this afternoon. Um, next, we have Mr. Warren Unsicker. Warren, did you have an additional question you'd like to ask? I'm also not seeing Warren in the chat. Warren, if you are on and you'd like to provide an additional question, if you're on the phone, press star nine, or you could press the raise hand function if you're as a lot joining us by Zoom. And I am not hearing anything from Mr. Unsicker. So Rebecca Sobel, you have also identified that you'd like to provide us with a question. If you are ready to do so, please raise your hand or press star nine if you are joining by phone. Rebecca, I do see that you're online, um, but I I don't see that you've raised your hand. Um, there we go. Okay, Rebecca, um, as with everyone else, I'm going to open your microphone as you press unmute. If you'll introduce yourself and just let's do a quick sound check and then you can provide us with your question. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I'm happy to, to not provide a question. I understand today is meant specifically for Navajo community engagement. I know we've heard from two Navajo representatives so far, so I wanna just make sure there's space for anyone from the community. Happy to offer my question on another day. Great, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for respecting uh, the focus audience for today's group. We look forward to engaging with you at a later date. Um, okay, I do not see anyone else with their hand raised. Audience, we would like to remind you that we are here accepting, not accepting, but we are here to respond to your questions for the next 40 minutes um, for this morning session. And again, we will be available this afternoon to respond to additional questions you may have or any of the three following days as well. Um, please use the raise hand feature or you could provide us a question through the chat box and we can read those out loud uh, to the audience. And it does not look like we have anyone wishing to provide a question at this time. Um, so I would like to throw something out at our ID team. And I think we can maybe call on Mr. Ryan Joyner Ryan, would you mind taking us through the life of a well, beginning at the land use planning stage all the way through uh, the plug and abandonment phase? Sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. And, and yeah, you know, you're correct. It does start all the way back at that land use planning stage. Or what you'll hear us talk about more in the BLM is the resource management planning stage. So you'll remember our talk of the 2003 RMP. You'll also think about a uh, document called the reasonably foreseeable development scenario. So everything that we're gonna be doing for an oil and gas well, for leasing, for development, is gonna start with our projections for what quantity of wells we see possible inside an area for leasing. Once we have that area identified as available for leasing, we'll go ahead and accept what are called expressions of interests, or we as the BLM will look at areas of drainage to see if we can uh, identify new leases that are possibly uh, potential for oil and gas operators to, uh, lease, or to, uh, to lease for oil and gas exploration. We go through a uh, period of analysis for that lease. We scope it against our current resource management plan and apply what are called lease stipulations in the form of CSU, timing limitation, and NSO, no surface occupancy, uh, stipulations that help us guide that development pattern that you see the oil and gas APDs eventually come in at. So once an oil and gas operator has uh, successfully bid upon a lease, it accepted those lease stipulations which are attached to that oil and gas lease on a federal surface oil and gas lease as well as any uh, lease that just has federal minerals that are uh, being developed. Those leases then uh, will guide how that APD may be analyzed by the BLM. The BLM receives what are called applications for permit to drill pursuant to onshore order number one, where we take a look at what are called the drilling plan, the engineering plan, as well as the surface use plan of operations, which are what we use to guide what's called the undertaking as we look at it as far as NEPA, uh, NEPA analysis is concerned. So once we have that APD or NOS in hand, notice of staking, this is the original document that starts that BLM undertaking. That's the process by which we start the onsite, by which we start talking about the uh, potential impacts to resources, and we start the engagement with our internal BLM ID team. You'll also see this is the beginning of where the BLM starts to talk with any landowners, any potential surface managing entities, or anybody else that could possibly be involved or interested in the permitting of this well. The BLM goes through an impacts analysis where we look at the direct, indirect, and cumulative impacts that are associated with that proposed action that's contained within inside that application for permit to drill. The BLM is engaging in what's called a two-part process. One, where we're reviewing the APD for completeness. Second, where we're looking at the impacts of that APD under the NEPA analysis guidelines. We then take a look at the final ending of the entire project. We would look at the entire APD package. We look at the entire mitigation um, suite that comes out of that environmental analysis or whatever kind of NEPA document that we're doing as a portion of this uh, permitting action. And we make sure that everything is copacetic inside our decision record because that becomes what are called the conditions of approval that are then used to uh, 
to permit, regulate, and uh, continue to inspect and enforce the well through the life of it. So once the BLM's gone through this process of permitting the APD through approving the NEPA analysis, we then actually can implement or allow the operator to implement their well. So that starts with the drilling, which the BLM uh, inspects at the construction stage, at the drilling stage, at the production stage, which is what we're talking about after we've gone ahead and fracked the well. And then finally, at the abandonment stage, where the BLM is looking at both the surface compliance and the subsurface compliance through the life of the well, all the way through the plugging and abandonment, all of which, which is permitted through the BLM, either under the original NEPA analysis, or if operations exceed the impacts of that original NEPA analysis, the BLM will continue to do subsequent and further NEPA analysis, allowing us to continue to do the impacts analysis we need on any of the impacts that come from a future well. Thanks, Ryan. That was a great overview. Um, we'll go back to Jill and see if we have any other questions coming up. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. That was great. Um, I was notified that we do have an attendee trying to raise her hand and um, we're unable to see that. So Cheyenne Antonio, uh, I am going to open up your microphone. Let's do a sound check real quick. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, Cheyenne, we can, thank you. All right, thank you. So from what I'm hearing, um, I just wanna acknowledge that I don't feel this is meaningful um, because I had to look for phone signal um, or just like access to Wi-Fi in order to be on this call. So if it was meaningful, like, I would see y'all in person at our chapter houses. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that my chapter house wasn't informed about this meeting or this process. Um, our tribal and chapter officials right now are actually focused on our community's health and well being and combating COVID 19. So I know you guys heard Mario earlier, he's actually traveling all across our territories that you plan to lease on um, in making sure that our livestock and our livelihood is supported. And so I just want to acknowledge that right now. Um, and also, let's see, I have my notes here. Let's see. So I have a couple of questions and some comments. My first question is um, how, hold on, hold on, hold on. How does this plan prevent the 2016 explosion from happening again? Um, how does this plan support our communities when it comes to missing and murdered indigenous women, um, especially when it comes uh, onto public slash stolen land, how is, how is it a priority when a person goes missing or murdered within these fields? Um, how does this plan address the crash in oil and gas prices? Because oil and gas is a dying industry and I wanna know like how you plan to support our communities. There's a lot of abandoned like wells here, um, abandoned like the one of those solar thingies that keep the oil and gas stuff going. I, and, and then also maybe like a map or some sort of like photo infographic of what like y'all are putting out here or allowing or leasing to put out here because like there's this produced water or I don't know, there's some nasty stuff in it and um, it's green but I don't know what it is. Like, I don't know what it is. And it doesn't feel good, you know, looking at it. It doesn't feel good breathing it in. It doesn't feel good lo losing family members to cancer. Um, and like, I've been to these meetings. I've gone to every scoping like meeting when they were out here. Um, and even like that wasn't very meaningful. And this, like having this over virtual, like, having this over a virtual um, meeting, like that also doesn't feel good because I don't feel like my life is taken seriously for living out here and like leasing land by the thousands. And um, I feel like there's really no, 
like it just yeah it just doesn't feel meaningful it doesn't feel safe and i don't understand how it's so easy to lease land when our people is like highly affected by covid 19. like i'm pretty sure y'all seen it on the news that navajo nation was hit and had the highest per capita in cases like like be like past surpassing new york city surpassing like all of these states and cities and Navajo Nation was highlighted. Like you saw our people suffering almost every day on the news and to be hit now with, you know, oh, we're gonna lease your water. We're gonna lease, you know, your air. We're gonna lease all of this. Like we're still trying to battle and and, and at least hear for y'all to hear us about the previous 2003 plan. Like, it's just ongoing. Like, I, like, I am so tired of just like, like, it, this is, this is tiring. This is tiring. So I just want to acknowledge that, like, we're out here fighting for our lives and Eastern Navajo, where you are targeting, we're almost at 800 cases within the Navajo nation. We're almost at 800 cases and we are protecting our elders. And so some of us don't have running water, some of us don't have electricity, but yet like all of the water is being leased. Like oil and gas is prioritized over our bodies. And so I want to just say that. And then uh, my other question is how does BLM, um, this plan worked to mediate, mediate environmental racism? Um, how does this plan comply with each, um, I almost say Eastern Navajo. How does this plan comply with environmental justice requirements? Um, and also like how do y'all plan to come out here? Do y'all plan to like, cause this isn't meaningful. Like do y'all plan to come to our chapter houses and tell our leaders yourselves like what you're planning on doing and through a pandemic and our elders um and then also like the navajo translation when i was hearing y'all on kndn um that wasn't like tra translated like as what you guys were saying like like all these big terms you can't really translate that into navajo like like the air quality and the infrared camera like all of that takes a lot of time for our elders to understand and there really isn't any support. Like if an Alati was concerned about their, you know, the methane emissions coming out, they don't have that support to figure out what's really leaking. Like they don't, instead they get sick. And so I just want to acknowledge that um, because, you know, I am a young person. Um, I am making sure that my family knows what's going on, whether they're an Alati or not, whether, you know, there's, a BLM like water well and it's all dry and like they want to know why it's dry and it's not working like there there also needs to be that too like maintaining these water wells for our livestock and I'm not you know with all these jurisdictions and having like I rem remember during the KNDN call an uncle said like there's 26 different jurisdictions so it's like really hard to find someone who is accountable to a water well when you know our animals need water like it's a drought it's dry out here some of us don't have running water and so there's that um let me see how does this let me see let me see how does this um how does the BLM justify new development in the public or tribe's best interest, especially the communities impacted? Um, the best interest as in like police substations, it actually takes um, longer for law enforcement to come out here when a crime happens than like y'all selling land on online. Like it's more easier for y'all to sell la land than it is for a person to get protection orders out here like how sad is that and so um i just want to acknowledge that and compare the struggles that we have out here um because the crime does happen um what happens to our lands happens to our bodies there's at least three four five six seven um homicide cases within the fbi that they're looking for someone to 
um, respond to of who did that crime. We don't know who comes here. We don't know the oil and gas workers out here. We don't know if they're here to harm us. We don't know if they're here to, you know, kidnap us. Like it's, it's such a, it's so hard. It's so hard. And so I just want to acknowledge that as well, that my community should have access to feel protected and safe, but that's not the case, especially during a pandemic. Like, okay, so there's that. Sorry, I don't, I don't really see y'all. So I'm just going to spill like everything. Um, because I've been waiting for this and I called um, KNDN like 36 times and my call wasn't answered. Um, let's see. Um, how does the Bureau of Land Management plan to remediate produced water spills? Um, there was a water spill back last February, hundreds of gallons of produced water was spilled and was leaking into our ditches, into um, into our arroyos. And I just like want to know why, like I barely, like our community found out until July. Um, so there's that, how, how do y'all plan to protect us and at whose standards? Because again, like, I don't know how many jurisdictions there are. There really just needs to be some sort of accountability when these leaks happen um, and where to get the information at. Or maybe y'all could come, you know, y'all came before and you can come again. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, and like the waste, um, because there is a lot of waste um, it looked beautiful before all of our lands were leased. And I just want to know like what's going to happen because like when you're heading towards Cuba or Apache Nugget Casino past um, Lybrook uh, Mission on the left side, there's abandoned like wells, oil and gas stuff. I don't even know that like the terms of it, but it, it doesn't look pretty. Um, it doesn't look nice. It doesn't look like what it was before. And so there's a lot of waste out here. And I just want to know, like, who's cleaning it up and, like, what policies and laws are supposed to clean that up. Like, there's a lot. Yeah, so that's all I have to say. Um, and I just want to, like, reiterate that this isn't meaningful because y'all aren't here and you don't live here. And the struggles here are different compared to, you know, having resources then and there in cities. So it's a lot different and it's hard out here. So I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you. Well, thanks, Cheyenne. You really provided us a lot of information, some things to consider. And we have a pretty long list of questions you provided today that we are going to work to respond to. Um, we apologize again that maybe that translation that happened last week on KNDN wasn't clear and uh, also that you are unable to get through but we are really happy that you're able to join us today and that we're able to begin responding to some of the questions you have. Um, I would also like to put out there that if your chapter house would like additional outreach meetings um, from the BLM and BIA to be conducted to please reach out to Sarah Scott or Robert Begay and they can work with you to get those set up if your chapter house is not comfortable with in-person meetings during this time, we could also set up something virtually. I know that's not always an option when there's not a lot of broadband capabilities in many areas, um, but we'd be glad to work with you to see what we can do to engage with you and ensure uh, that we're responding to any questions you might have and be able to give an overview of the project and how we're moving forward with it. So Cheyenne, we, again, we, got quite a bit of information from you. Um, I think we're going to be throwing questions to various people on both the BLM and BIA team. Um, I'm going to throw the first set of questions to the BLM Farmington Field Office Manager, Rick Fields. Um, if you remember, Rick introduced himself earlier today. Um, and Rick, the the first question that we heard from Cheyenne was, how does this plan prevent explosions like the 2016 explosion that occurred. Okay, uh, thank you for the, the questions, Cheyenne. You gave us 
quite a bit to unpack here. Um, the fire that was at the WPX well in 2016 was caused by a static discharge. Uh, all incidents like that are covered under the safety plans that are put in, in place by the operators for their wells. Uh, unfortunately, on occasion, there will be an incident at a well, but they're fairly rare. Um, the plan does not address such items as how are you going to prevent a fire, and, um, but it, it does ensure that the operators are complying with all of the ONTRO orders and rules that require site safety. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just go down uh, some of the things you have here on the list before I, I kick it back to, to you, Jill. Um, you mentioned the missing and murdered um, Native women. That is outside the scope of the plan. Uh, I will say that unlike in areas like down at um, Carlsbad area where they have a large influx of workers from outside the area and use man camps, that the San Juan Basin traditionally does not use man camps and most of the uh, labor comes from the local area, local being broadly the, the Four Corners area, not necessarily library, but um, most of the labor comes from within the local community and area. Um, you mentioned abandoned wells. There are no abandoned wells in the Farmington Field Office uh, and, and orphan wells. Uh, what we do have is some wells that will temporarily um, shut in uh, because of various factors and they plan to go into production again. So the, the wells are taken offline and then as things come back uh, uh, market wise, they will then be put back into production. If it is taken offline and out of production for a lengthy time, there are rules at which point where it needs to be um, plugged and abandoned. So at, those are two terms we use in BLM. Uh, abandoned doesn't mean the company just walked away. It means they're no longer operating the well for production and they have to plug it and the well goes away. Um, orphan wells are wells that a company might have gone bankrupt and there was no one to plug the well and the BLM works on getting those plugged in conjunction with the state of New Mexico. But we have no orphan wells in the Farmington field office. Uh, you mentioned leasing during COVID-19. The Farmington field office has not had a lease during this time. Um, most of the uh, lease activity has been getting ready for upcoming leases, but um, there have been no uh, leasing during uh, COVID-19. You mentioned leasing your water. Uh, we do not lease water. Water is handled through the state of New Mexico. Um, the operators, when they are producing a well um, and getting ready to drill, they have to let us know what the water source they are using is from, but that is all handled by the state. And the operators here are generally not using fresh water. They're generally using it from Entrada formation, or they'll use a small amount of water from Entrada and also nitrogen for fracking. So there's not a lot of fresh water used in the San Juan Basin for well stimulation and production. Um, you asked, how do we justify development? Um, there are laws and regulations that we have to follow. Uh, we are a, a multiple use agency and uh, minerals development is one of the things that we're mandated by law to um, oversee. Uh, it, it's not a case of how can we um, justify doing it here in the farm, Farmington area versus doing it somewhere else. It's, it's all laid out on a national scale of what our responsibilities are for developing mineral resources. Um, you also mentioned about selling land is easier than police protection. Uh, again, uh, items like police and fire protection are outside the scope of our plan and we do not um, address that in the plan. Also, we are not selling land. Um, just to be clear, the land may be leased for um, production, but that land is not sold. It's just the minerals that they have the rights to. Um, I will let others ad address the um, water spills and such. The You said it, it, it doesn't look pretty with the abandoned wells. Those, those wells are also um, either in production or temporarily taken offline. And I think those are the ones I am going to uh, address and I'll let you, um, Jill, redirect the ones for things like EJ. Great, 
great. Thanks, Rick. We would also like our co-lead BIA to respond to some of the concerns that Cheyenne brought forward. Uh, Robert, can you and your team uh, provide some input on this discussion, please? And just real quick, this is Sarah. Um, after uh, Robert, you guys respond to some of that, we will come back to BLM and uh, talk about some of the resource specific issues. So go ahead, Robert. Again, great. That was, there is a lot of questions in there. Thank you, Cheyenne. Um, I will refer the questions to our superintendent concerning the chapters and the environmental justice. And then Maureen will address the water issues and a couple other issues. Thank you. Superintendent. Uh, good morning. This is Superintendent Left Associates, Bureau of Indian Affairs for Eastern Nova Agency. Uh, we're still trying to work through some of that this technology, but I think you all can hear me. Um, I'd like to answer two areas. One is on the notification to the tribal members and then the environmental justice. The first one is that we've been working with the Bureau of Management since uh, 2016 when we became a co-lead in this effort of the RMPA work that we're doing. Um, so since then, really been, I've been involved in numerous meetings, conversations, discussions, not only with the BLM and not only on internal meetings that we've held, but we have made um, extraordinary efforts to engage tribal communities uh, in Eastern Nova Agency that are impacted. Uh, some examples of what we recently have done to provide notification is that I also appear on the Eastern Nova Agency chapter's COVID-19 coordination meeting on a weekly basis with council delegates, chapter leaders, uh, from Eastern Nava Agency, I have personally made the announcements of these, the RMPA work sessions and the uh, radio remote, as well as the virtual open houses that we're doing today. So I've been uh, providing constant updates to chapter leadership on that. Um, the, the, another example is that we have provided direct information to Nava Nation Council delegates for the impacted areas. Uh, as you might have heard earlier today, uh, Delegate So's letter was read by his assistant. That means really that he's involved in, in the process and the information related to this RMPA. We've also provided uh, information to the Office of the President and Vice President for the Navajo Nation on these different dates and the types of different sessions that are being uh, implemented. We also provided newspaper ads announcing the different uh, meetings and sessions related to the RMPA. In addition, there was a, an email flyer with all the logistics that were provided to Eastern Nova Agency chapter leadership. So we are trying to reach out to as many people as possible. And believe me, I was um, one of those that might have had some doubts at the beginning on how we engage tribal communities. And I have uh, really been um, adamant with our internal meetings and team discussions and planning that we reach out to tribal members. Uh, in fact, uh, we really, from the BIA side, have been requesting that we make sure there's translators available for many of these meetings. So there's a concerted effort going on trying to reach out to tribal members to engage in these different discussions and conversations and, and seeking their comments on the RMPA. Just a, a few comments on the environmental justice, um, which is clearly defined in the RMPA as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to development implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So that is a really uh, lengthy 
definition of what environmental justice is. We, uh, from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and working with BLM, have uh, respected and requested and encouraged uh, involvement of tribal members and tribal communities that are in being impacted by this RMPA. If there's something that, that we might be missing, we certainly um, ask that you, you let us know through our project managers. Last comment is that the environmental justice discussion in the draft EIS can be found at page 3-217. Again, in the volume one of the draft EIS, there's a discussion on environmental justice at, at page 3-217. Certainly, we need your comments in, regarding environmental justice if, if you feel like we can um, add more to that. Thank you very much. I want to turn it over to Maureen at this time. Thank you, Superintendent Sophie. Again, hello, Cheyenne. You have some great questions and some great concerns. One of your questions was in regards to outreaches. Under the Federal Indian Minerals Program, we have four agencies that repre that's represented under that program. The Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Land Management, Office of Natural Resource Revenue, and the Office of Special Trustee for American Indians. Under that umbrella, we have the authority to oversee oil and gas activity on Navajo Indian allotted from the time the allotment is leased through the time that allotment is no longer producing and we have to reclaim that area. Your question had asked, what are we doing with those locations that have been plugged and abandoned? I understand, I've seen, and I know. With that in mind, what we have done on the Federal Indian Mineral Site in collaboration with the Bureau of Land Management, as well as the Bureau of Indian Affairs, is that we have inventoried those locations in the last seven months to go out and inspect those locations and to move forward to start reclaiming those areas, as well as closing out those active leases. So within the next year, year or two, people will see some work being done in the Eastern Agency on Navajo Indian allotted leases. Your other question in regards to spills that happen on Indian allotted. Again, under the Federal Indian Minerals Program, in conjunction with the Bureau of Land Management, as well as the Bureau of Indian Affairs, as well as with the Navajo Nation EPA, as well, with the New Mexico, state of New Mexico. We work together to ensure that the area is clean per rules regulations of the different departments. FEMO takes the lead in ensuring as well as the BLM to make sure that that allotment is clean, that allotment is reclaimed, that allotment is reseeded as well as monitored. We have had a couple of spills on Indian allotted, and I personally have been on locations to ensure things are cleaned up per rules, regulations, and policy. So from that perspective, as director of the Federal Indian Minerals Program, I am doing the best I can to ensure that the land that belongs to the Indian allottees are well taken care of. And let me assure you that I'm not doing this on my own. I have support from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, as well as the BLM, as well as the Office of Natural Resource Revenue. Back to the outreaches. Under the Office of Natural Resource Revenue, we do outreaches close to 100 of them a year. Within a year in collaboration with BLM, BIA, Honor, Office of Natural Resource Revenue, and OST, 
we have a representative from each agency that go out to the chapter areas and we address any issues that the community may or may not have. And we do the best we can. And in some of those outreaches, we do a one-on-one -on -one session. We have gone through all the way from Annis, Utah, all the way down to Pueblo Cantata, Ojo and Sino Council. We do the best that we can, as I have said. So when it comes to outreaches, we have been working hand in hand with the individual Alati. There has been uh, a number, there was a, a huge fire that everybody alludes to or mentions as we move through this plan. During the time of the fire, there had been some hiccups, but since then there has been work on putting a management plan and a response plan together so that the different agencies, specifically in the checkerboarded area, as complicated and complex as it is, they're putting a management plan together to ensure that their appropriate personnel that needs to be on site will be able to assist and do the things that we need to do. Those are um, what I've come up with based off of the questions you have asked and I'll throw that back over to BLM. Thank you. Uh, Jill, quickly. Um, the there's something going on here. Okay, again, I just wanted to address um, Miss Cheyenne Tintio's um, question on the translation on KNDN. Again, just want to reiterate that we are trying very hard and um, to address some of those. Um, translations in Navajo. Um, again, it uh, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of uh, uh, several people to chime in and to describe some of the technical words and try to translate it into Navajo to make it clear and concise for our Navajo, viewer, our Navajo speaking um, audience. And again, we are trying and we'll continue to improve on that. Thank you. Thank you, Robert and Lester and Maureen. That, that's some great uh, information. Um, and I just wanted to add one more thing, um, Cheyenne. This is I'm, this is Sarah Scott, the project manager on the BLM side. Um, you mentioned a map, and uh, uh, having a map would be helpful to to show certain things. So I'd like to offer you to reach out to me at your convenience and we can talk a little bit more about what kind of map that um, we can get for you. Um, and then also if there's more concerns that you have at that time that we can, uh, we can uh, address. Um, so then I'll turn it back to Jill and thanks for your question, Cheyenne. Yeah. Yeah, thanks Cheyenne and thanks to everyone for that collaborative response to Cheyenne. We do have a couple of questions that have rolled into our chat function. However, we are quickly approaching noon. And so we are scheduled to end this morning session right at noon. So those two questions that have come in, we will begin, we'll kick off the afternoon session by responding to those. So please plan on joining us again, beginning at 1 p.m. And BLM, our BI, do you have any um, closed out thoughts for this morning session? Just real quick comments. Thank you again for all the people that chimed in and called in for questions. Hopefully that would um, clarify some of your questions and direct you to encourage you to look at the draft EIS. And again, thank you very much for calling me. And again, we have a one o'clock today from one to four today. Thank you. Great, thanks, Robert. Al, did you wanna speak for BLM? 
I did just a couple of closing thoughts. Um, really want to take the time to, to thank everybody that called in um, either on the phone or via the zoom meeting function itself. I think we had a lot of really great questions that came up and you know, really, and, and I guess this, this goes back to my days teaching. Um, please, if you do have a question, do not hesitate to ask it, no matter how mundane you may think it is. If it's a question you have, it's a question other folks have. And I think we're, um, we're seeing that there's a lot of um, technical information that's being presented in this EIS. And, you know, we don't expect even our specialists to be able to understand everything that another um, subject matter expert may have written. So if there's something that you feel needs clarification, we're, we've got a, a whole nother afternoon session devoted to this particular audience. Um, but I also would encourage anybody that's calling in today to join us for our public sessions on Friday and Saturday as well. Or if there's any other uh, tribal or Puebloans um, that wanna join us tomorrow and ask those questions, that would be great as well, or any of the other days. Um, last thing I wanted to mention before we go for a, a quick break before our one o'clock session, going back to the translations, um, I really want to recognize everybody that has helped us out, both our um, contracted translator as well as our Navajo speakers in both the BLM and BIA. Um, we, we have, of course, a contractor that has been doing a fantastic job in translating. But as you can imagine, especially during that uh, radio show, that um, that was a very tiring exercise for him. So he did have to take a break every now and then, and we filled in as best we could with our native Navajo speakers who, who live and work in the area. And um, certainly apologize if anybody feels like the translations were not spot on. I recognize that there are a number of different dialects of Navajo that are spoken throughout the planning area. Um, so if you do have questions or concerns about that, or if you feel like um, maybe you've got some uh, ideas that you can pass along on how to make that better, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're doing the best that we can in a very uncertain time and um, anything that we can do to improve, we're certainly open to hearing. So on that note, I just wanna thank everybody again, our partners at BIA and all of our staff with BLM as well, and look forward to a good afternoon session. Thanks, and I'll turn it back to you guys. Great, thanks, Al. And then Superintendent Sosi with the BIA would also like to provide some closing remarks this morning. I just wanna say and reiterate that we really appreciate people taking the time, especially the callers to call in with their questions. I uh, really do appreciate our staff responding to those questions. Um, these questions are not easy, they're complicated, and so that's why we have our subject matter experts on the line today, all the way through Saturday, and um, you can just imagine how much time they, they're going to have, they're taking to respond to these questions. We really appreciate their response and work that they're doing, and, and then I also want to thank, again, those folks that are translating into the language. One of my role as a superintendent is really try to inform our tribal members to the different communities. And uh, we do have, you know, many, many of our tribal members that speak the language. And so there are some differences um, for that in terms of translating. Uh, course, あ、
Thank you very much. Thank you, Superintendent. So we will go ahead and close out from this morning's sessions. We look forward to your continued involvement this afternoon.